what we're going to be looking at this morning is using um, the H2O uh, cloud with Snowflake. Um, and we use that in a couple of different, a couple of different ways. Um, the, the goals for, uh, for the session is to um, provide a high level overview really of what the integration is about. But how do you really use that integration to build models, to put them into production so they can be scored against data in, in real time or in batch? Um, and with both of those approaches, you know, there are different SLA requirements around how you, um, you know, how you put them into production. So if it's a real time, you might want you know, uh, very fast latency for the prediction. Um, if it's a batch operation, you might have several very large models that can take a long time to process massive amounts of data in Snowflake. And so we'll give you some ideas on how to look at different ways to put those into that environment. And then also we'll look at the integration application um, that is in uh, H2O uh, Cloud. Uh, and that helps us to deploy and to monitor these applications. So we'll be touching each of these points um, as we go through um, this morning. Um, when we look at the, uh, the ecosystem of Snowflake, um, it really touches each of the um, points that we try to uh, look at when we build some integration and deploy models. So of course it starts off with, with training and you know, how we take the data from Snowflake generate features to create, you know, very accurate models. Um, but that's only part of the, you know, part of that journey. Um, it's not until the application can consume that in production um, that really a business starts to get value out of the models that are being created. And so the deployment part of this is a really strong story. Um, what we want to be able to do is make it very simple to deploy the models but also have a way to monitor them and ensure that they're doing the, you know, the correct type of predictions that the data and scientist team um, envisioned for that model. Integrating the models directly into Snowflake is you know, one of the very powerful things that allow us to use both of the technologies from both Snowflake and from um, the H2O AI side as well. And that integration allows us to move the model directly into Snowflake as, a, as an option, and that's the user-defined function or UDF, um, but also put them into uh, a, a mode where they can be called externally through the external function. And that can be useful for several different types of uh, applications and things that Snowflake may, might require. Um, but all the way through, all of the features that we talk about um, are available for you know, for getting explainability, um, using APIs or UIs to, to generate um, the models and the, and the outputs that we're going to see. You know, one of the things that's really uh, quite interesting is what the experience has been with customers that have used the integration. Um, the key point for me is really on the last column, you know, things that used to take hours are now being done you know, in minutes. Um, and that's really quite key, right? As, as the market is, you know, very competitive in most industries now, the idea of actually providing results just in time, at the right time, in the right place, is, is key to differentiating yourself between, you know, other competitors. And the way the integration works allows us to do exactly that. We can call these models in real time because they literally look like a SQL stored procedure. And that means that anything in Snowflake or any application that uses Snowflake can actually get these predictions in real time. One of the things that one of our other customers told us was just how easier it was to inference or score the data um, and the models um, in Snowflake. You know, previously, you know, it was a complicated process of extracting data, um, running it in maybe a different environment, and then uploading the results back again. What this allowed us to do with our integration was remove that step, making it very simple to actually just put things directly into the environment to score without um, any other 
um, integration or offloading of data. And that was really key for, um, for Infuter. Now, you know, we're gonna talk a little bit about how we access the Snowflake data here. Um, when we actually go to start training, the first thing that we will actually do is start with pulling data into, um, into driverless AI to train. And there's a couple of different ways that we will do that. We'll look at using this from a H2O drive. Um, and that's a common storage location that we have inside of Managed Cloud. It allows us to uh, take data from Snowflake, put it into a location that can then be used by our um, auto ML engines. We're gonna look at driverless in particular today. We can also load data directly into driverless. You know, perhaps you're doing some training um, on-prem or maybe you're doing some in the cloud, but you can also use driverless AI to access the data using the Snowflake connector. And then of course, um, as I'd mentioned earlier, if you don't want to use an, uh, you know, a user interface, we can do all of this through a notebook as well. So we have Python APIs. We're gonna look at a couple of examples of how to actually do this directly as we go through. So let's start with H2O Drive. Um, it's a application that resides inside of Managed Cloud and it enables us to really easily share application data across the, um, the driverless engines on the AutoML engines that reside in the cloud. The way we do this is by creating a configuration that can easily be set up um, inside of Managed Cloud and then um, use that to import the data. This UI provides a free form um, SQL uh, panel that we can then type our SQL into um, and that allows us to access those tables um, directly into Drive. So a quick example of what this looks like is with the, um, uh, with the panel here, I'd actually previously had created a connector and you can see on the, on, on, on the darker panel here, um, I have a profile name of Snowflake, my user information, my account information to access the Snowflake uh, data cloud that we have. And then what warehouse um, I will pull this data from. Um, once I've actually created that uh, uh, set of credentials for this connector, I can then actually go ahead and pull in data directly. And so I do that by issuing this query. As I said, uh, we have this freeform panel. So you can sort of see there, I'm doing a very simple select um, from a, a table called Lending Club. But the, the, the query could be much more complicated. You know, I could be doing a join uh, from maybe two different tables. I could be doing, you know, some... Um, you know, some very complicated things there, including pulling data from, you know, an external table, for example. The other um, field there is where I want this data to be stored. So it's going to be stored inside of Drive, um, and it's going to be called Snowflake H2O Lending Club. Um, so it's a very easy just for me to find it in the demo. All right, so we're going to do a poll now. Uh, what is the key to using closely integrated platforms within your organization? Uh, is it the ability to easily use functionality unique to each platform, the ability to enforce security and organizational data policies, uh, the reduction in time to move a model into production? If it's other and you're, you're comfortable sharing what other uh, features you'd be looking for, please write them in the chat as well. All right, we're going to give everyone a few more seconds to get some answers in. All right, let's see the results. Looks like a fairly even split, but the reduction in time to move a model into production is, is definitely the most popular. Yeah, that's really interesting um, 
spread there. Um, you know, security is obviously very key with with everyone. Um, and what we've done with uh, the integration is allow the uh, the credentials that are used by Snowflake to you know to govern what data you can use for for training. Um, and then, of course, when we go to train, uh, we're pulling that data and building a model on it. On the deployment side, um, when that model goes into production, of course, um, you know, there are security policies around that still. And, you know, the production piece of that, the, the whole reduction in time is actually a key part to the integration, which we'll look at later on in this, in this session, because, um, you know, making it easy for a data engineer to now consume the model. Um, you know, they might not necessarily be familiar with what columns you've used or, you know, what features are actually being generated or even how to go and use it directly inside of Snowflake. So we spent a lot of time actually concentrating on, on that. So it looks like we've got some, some pretty good, some pretty good alignment with, with those pieces. Um, let me carry on here. Um, okay. So that's really interesting um, feedback. Thank you for for everyone that voted there. When we use driverless, um, you know, what we're able to do is pull that data into, you know, into us for, um, for training. Um, and there's some things we can do in driverless to um, make sure the data is being um, parsed correctly. And so there's a, there's, a, there's a field called fields optionally enclosed by. And so so what Snowflake will do is they will put quotes around um, fields that have strings in them. Um, and I put a little annotation there on the, on the side because it's a little hard to see, but it's a single quote, double quote, single. Um, it looks a little funny when you put it into the, in, you know, when you write it out, but that's, uh, that's how it looks. Um, and then also if it's null, how does that get handled? Um, now, in most environments, and when you go to pull data, you will need to specify your, your account credentials for Snowflake so that we um, you know, access the data that you're allowed to, um, to access for your account. Um, and one of the things to remember is to actually um, save these for next time. Um, and so if we look at the driverless UI um, interface, one of the things that we're doing here is actually pulling in some, um, some data uh, to train on. And you see here under the, under the tab, we have a Snowflake um, option, which is the Snowflake uh, connector. This is where we will type in our credentials um, and also those formatting strings. And then just like in Drive, we have a, a panel where we can type in our SQL. Um, you know, it can be, you know, much more complicated than the simple select, but it enables you to pull that data directly. You can think of it as we're receiving a result set from that, from that query. And then there's a check mark to remember this so you don't have to retype things uh, for, for next time. Um, so once we've got the data within inside of, um, Within inside of uh, driverless, what we want to be able to do, of course, is to, to train these models. Um, and, you know, we quite often will see data scientists want to use other, other approaches on the, the, other than the UI. So, for example, things like, um, you know, going through a, uh, a notebook, maybe using Snowpark as a way to do this, um, because you, you might very well want to do some some data prep step inside of Snowpark and use some of the um, some of that functionality in Snowpark to leverage the scalability of the data cloud to prepare the data. Maybe you're going to you know average a set of columns or do some data um, some data prep work before you actually give the data to to driverless or to drive to um, uh, to train on. The other thing that you can actually do is if you're using the, um, the Snowflake external function integration is you can um, actually initiate training um, from a select statement. Um, and so you sort of see a select statement there as an example where we basically issue a select with um, a function called h2o train. And we're gonna tell it, we're gonna build a model 
we specify the table name, um, the target column, and we can specify some of the other options that driverless will, will use. If you're familiar with some of the driverless options, you, you can select things like time, interpretability, accuracy. And so you can define those in the definition as well if you wanted to. Um, clone is actually an option where we um, use Snowflake to basically snapshot the data we're going to use to build this model. Uh, and that's really useful for, um, for industries that are heavily governed or regulated that require you know, the actual data that was used when, you know, when a model was trained. And then lastly, what will this model be called once we've actually finished um, the training exercise? And so pipeline.mojo is actually just one of the, just had the fault name, but uh, you could put something there that was more meaningful and, you know, in line with the business, maybe risk model or customer churn.mojo, something like that. Either way, whichever way you choose, whether it's the UI or the API, the model accuracy is the same, the amount of time you know, that we spend training is the same, just whichever um, interface you're more comfortable with. So let's look at this example of using Snowpark. Um, as I mentioned, you know, a lot of uh, data scientists are you know, super familiar with doing things on Python. Sometimes they would actually prefer doing that um, just because of the level of control and familiarity they are with, um, with it over the different tools. Um, but what we start off with is, you know, first of all, this, this is actually auto-generated. Um, and I'll show you how to do that actually in the integration uh, application. We can generate code for you for a particular model that you can then use to, you know, um, either score or build or use the model in some, you know, in some fashion within your environment. Um, so this is auto gen and you see on line nine, we're actually pulling in the Snowflake Snowpark library. Now Snowpark's a, a really amazing API. It enables the, the data table that we're going to access the data, basically it look like a data frame. Um, so it's super, super familiar to uh, data scientists that uses Python, but it makes it um, very simple to consume um, the data we need. Um, we're actually going to set a, um, uh, a couple of things here on line 16, um, basically where driverless is sitting. Uh, maybe we're using driverless uh, on-prem in this example, um, but we're going to deploy through into the cloud and pull data from Snowflake's data cloud into us. So we have to tell where us where driverless is living. Um, we also need to specify exactly where we go and get the data from our Snowflake account. So lines 21 through 28 basically just help to define the, you know, the credentials and the warehouse that you want to use. You can sort of see that um, where, we, where we start using the Snowpark APIs directly um, line 32 is where we actually start to now get um, a session to Snowflake that we use to grab the data. And we see on line 37 that this really is a data frame. Um, and what we're going to do is take that data frame. We could do some more interesting work here. Um, as I'd mentioned, we might want to munch some data, maybe enrich it with some, some other data I have maybe in a file. Um, but in my case, I'm just going to do a really quick um, two CSV. Um, and then we're going to push it into driverless, which is what we see on line 42, where we actually connect to driverless and then push the data um, up into a data set that driverless has access to. You see that on line 43. Now, if you're familiar with the way driverless looks for things, we call building uh, a model an experiment. Um, and so we're going to uh, preview an experiment, which will allow driverless to look at the data, maybe set some defaults, tell us what it's going to do. And that's what line 49 um, through 57 will do. It's going to basically going to tell us what it thinks we should be doing with this data and the types of models it's going to include. Um, there's a config override you notice there on line 56 where um, a data scientist that was familiar with the APIs might want to specify certain options. 
Um, I've skipped this for, for the moment and on line 59, I actually go straight to creating um, the experiment that will build the model. And on line 70, we see we're now gonna measure these results. And these results allow us to see how accurate the model was. And at this point, the model is now ready to go ahead and be, be deployed, which we'll look at uh, in a minute. And so deploying models, as I said, is actually a, a choice. There's, there's numerous different SLA requirements that you have for scoring. And so when I go to deploy a model, some of the things I want to think about is, you know, um, where do I want this model to live? Do I want it to live inside of, you know, the Snowflake data cloud, which will be a UDF? Do I want to just call it externally? Um, and I might want to do that because of the SLA, the type of language the model's written in. And so in my mind, I kind of, you know, have this little decision tree, if you like, and I think, well, what is the model written in? If it's written in Python, it's going to be an external function um, because the Python library has a lot of um, native libraries um, that need to exist um, in order for the models to be scored. Um, an example of um, using the external function might be, you know, I've got a manufacturing plant that's using Snowflake and they're taking pictures of images of, um, you know, components being built. And they might want to actually make predictions on whether those components, uh, you know, appear faulty based on, a, on an image. That unstructured data in the image uh, needs a number of uh, native libraries that execute outside of Snowflake for, um, for their prediction. And that would be an external function. The external function is also great for real time. And it's kind of counterintuitive in that the external function actually is highly concurrent with multiple connections um, connecting to the endpoint to score and make inferences. It can do that um, very, very quickly. You, you will find several examples in other webinars where we show you know, several seconds to score you know, tens of thousands of, uh, of rows. But the UDF is really um, very, very powerful. And so if the, if the UDF is available and I've got a mojo that's gonna score some structured data and a mojo is a model object optimized, it's a Java artifact that we, that we produce. Then putting the model directly into the UDF basically moves the model to where the data lives. So there's no data movement. Um, and it will scale the same way that the warehouse scales. So this is a super powerful way to um, get the model um, into that environment as well. And we'll look at both of these as we go through the example. So, you know, here, what I've done is I've uploaded um, a model. We'll see this in the, in the demo in a moment, but we can actually upload uh, directly into Snowflake. This goes to a staging table uh, that is hosted in Snowflake. And I'm given an option, I've selected the UDF. Um, literally at that point, I'm able to use the model directly for scoring. And what this allows us to do is to um, basically have a SQL call. Maybe I'm doing you know, an update function or a select um, to select some data. I can have the model as part of that SQL function call. And you know, when you think about the power of this, right, for any application or downstream process, it now means that those applications can get the data from Snowflake and a prediction that is current based on that data right then and there when they do the query. You know, older ways that would have done this before would they have would have extracted the data, done some processing, created some some predictions on the data, and then upload those predictions back into the environment, the Snowflake environment. The problem is, is that that's great on day one, but seven days from now, that prediction could be stale, right? Because the data has changed. Um, you know, there might be new account information, there might be a new number of SKUs that are available in the warehouse, new risk factors if it's a risk model. Um, so being able to access the data in real time 
and get the predictions then and there when you need them is really what the power of the scoring integration brings you. Um, we can score that through the SQL cores, or we can score it and schedule it through the UI. Um, and we also provide a API that allows us to score them you know, directly in, inside of the managed cloud environment. So a really quick look um, before we look at the, at the demo, when we go to score a model that was previously uploaded, one of the things that we go through and do is we auto generate the query based on the model. And we do that because you know, a data scientist is quite often handed off the production steps to a production team, maybe an application programmer, a data engineer. Um, and rather than having to go through and explain what columns that are needed or how to call the model, we generate that for them. Um, so it's very simple to then take those examples um, and either implement them directly or add any tweaks they need for their environment so that it's simple to consume the model and reduce that time to production, right? Get that time from production shorter, more concise. Um, and, you know, here's that example of calling this through um, the managed cloud. Uh, what we actually do with this model is we make a call, you can see here on, uh, on line 11 through 16, basically all we do is you tell us the, the model you want to call, the, the file, um, and that, was a, that could actually be either a, a file or a data frame. And if you don't have a number of rows on line 40, we do the entire, entire uh, file. And then on line 20, we actually run this asynchronously to go off and call and score and get the predictions back. That enables us to scale you know, very, very quickly and handle massive amounts of calls that are being made um, to the scorer. Now, as I said earlier, you know, once you go into production, getting it into production is only half the problem, right? Um, you know, we've now got it into production. We want to make sure that the model is actually operating the way that it was intended for this business problem. Um, so we want to collect metrics that enable um, you know, a, a operations team to understand, you know, the latency, if there are any errors, but we also want to gather statistics that the data scientists can use so that they know that the, if there's data that shifted, if the uh, calls are using the wrong columns, if there's things that are missing, maybe the data's parsed differently. Um, and then operationally, we also want to understand what the cost of that execution is. So, we gather those metrics and make them available through, um, through the tooling as well. We can see here, I'm actually looking at the integration app and I'm looking at a Java UDF. I'm looking at um, a risk model, .mojo. Um, and what we've seen is on this from between the start and end date, how many times the model was uh, invoked um, how many rows were actually um, scored, processed by the, by the model, um, what the credits used uh, within the Snowflake environment was, and then the average latency for each of those calls. This is in nanos, right? So it's 3.4 um, seconds to, uh, to do this. Um, and that would have been across the entire table. Um, so making that data easily accessible, um, especially over different date ranges. So maybe you want to compare, you know, data changes from this month to last month or a different version of the model. All that data is there and you can query it through the tool. So let's look at, let's take a quick look at what this, uh, what this looks like from the, um, from the tools that we've, that we've mentioned. So, um, I started a copy of driverless uh, earlier, um, as well as the drive and the, and the Snowflake app. So let's start with drive. Um, we, we looked at this earlier on and what we had, what we had done was we had looked at um, the, um, 
internal uh, connector itself. Um, and so this was a way for us to look at the connector, make those configuration changes, and then um, pull in the data. Now, one of the things that we can do at this point too, is we can also refresh the data as well. Um, so if I'm pulling in some data, maybe for um, some monthly cadence of building a model, I'm able to actually do this um, through, through this tooling. Now, if I've gone through and um, built the model with driverless, um, driverless gives me the option of either pulling the data in directly from, um, from drive. And see here, um, I can pull it in from drive. You'll see um, that the data that I pulled in on uh, the, the lending club from my query and drive is available here. Or I could actually go through and uh, pull it in through the Snowflake connector as well. And you sort of see here, because I clicked remember the settings, everything is here. All I need to do is re-execute um, this as, you know, as need be to, to, to pull the data in. Once I have the data, I'm able to you know, visualize the data, um, look at the details of what's been pulled in, just look at the data very quickly to look at the, the shape of the columns that have been brought in. These will be, you know, some of, the, some of these will be turned into features for the model, some of them will be dropped, but I'm able to do that through here. Um, we're not gonna go through the building step today. I mean, there's a number of presentations around, around that. Um, but what, what I wanted to do was look at what happens once the model has actually been built. And so one of the things that we want to be able to do is to take this, um, take this model, once, we've, once we're happy that it's been built and validated by the data scientist, I can download either the Python scoring pipeline or the Mojo and go ahead and deploy that into the environment. Um, each of these have um, different characteristics. Um, so for example, if it's a, an image model, it's going to be a Python uh, pipeline that will be generated. Um, if it's uh, something like some structured data, depending on the, the models and some of the settings that I used, um, it could be a Mojo um, in addition to a Python um, scoring pipeline. And that's one of those first things that I'll use to decide how I want to go ahead and deploy this, depending on what artifacts are available. So in the Snowflake application, um, if, I sign, if I sign in um, to this environment, what I'm able to, what I'm able to do is to um, pick the, um, the approach that I want to use for, for scoring. So the first thing that happens when I go to sign in is I'll be asked to pick a particular warehouse. Um, I'm gonna put it into the lending club and I can type these in or I can select them from the you know, drop down. It's, uh, it doesn't uh, either work through the, through the tool. And what I can do now that I have connected is go ahead and deploy um, the model that we, that we selected. If I go to, um, to browse a model quickly, let me just find one on my desktop. Um, what I can do at this point is just pick up a, a model and I will find a, Pretty really easy way just to take this model <clears throat> and I'll just drag and drop it onto the environment. Now, when I've uploaded that, now what happens is it asks me um, how I want to deploy this model. Um, and again, depending on my SLA and the, you know, the type of model artifact that's available, you know, Python or Mojo, sort of helps direct me to which one I want to use. I'm gonna use the, the UDF because it's, um, it's very simple to go through and deploy. And I'm going to, I'm just gonna call this test.mojo. Um, I know I've got one already and I'll go ahead and deploy this. 
Now, what we actually do behind the scenes here is we upload it into the staging table. We um, define a function for this model, um, add in the integration code that's needed automatically and deploy it. Once it's deployed, it's available now to anything inside that Snowflake environment. Um, and that enables us to very quickly get into a production state, but also enable other applications to use it. And that's it, it's actually now deployed and, and live. Now, one of the things I might do at this point is want to pass this to a data engineer. And so the data engineer might want to do some, you know, some data prep or a programmer might want to maybe call the model in a variety of different ways. And this is what Autogen is used for. So Autogen enables me to you know, pick my model. And you can see we've got a number of models here. Let's just pick this risk model we started the demo with. If I list the artifacts that are available here, um, what I might do, for example, is I might want to give it um, to a data engineer that uses dbt. So we can generate a dbt resource, and that will be available um, for them to download and use a materialized view of this model. Um, we might, for example, want to generate a, a SQL worksheet or a Python notebook or Snowpark, as we saw in the in the in, in the slides earlier. That's all available, all available through here, right? Number of different options to pick up different Snowpark, Snow SQL to to consume the model. That will allow me to do everything through the API to predict um, or even schedule predictions. But you could also go through and make those predictions here as well. So if I pick up, um, if I click on predict and I pick up the, the model that we looked at um, earlier, what it's going to go through and do is enable me to score on a particular model um, or set when that should happen. Um, now, one of the things that we want to, of course, go through and do is once the prediction has, has happened is how do I go through and pick my table? So let's pick a the landing club table if we want. And what we want to ensure we do is um, get the monitoring data around how that prediction is occurring. And that's, that's key because we want to ensure that the model is scoring directly the way that it was intended. Um, and that's what we have with, um, with the monitor piece here. So I'm just gonna go back uh, you know, a week or so, a couple of weeks, pick up a model. I can pick the model that I want to score on. Um, or get the details, as you say, of the scoring. And what we do now is get an understanding of if there are any errors at scoring time, or if there are any things that, that happened, um, maybe data transformation problems with the data. Um, and so we have a little explanation about what this monitoring does. Basically, this was invoked 35 times, how many rows, the credits, there were, there were no errors that were uh, that happened. But if there were errors, these are the things that the data science team would need. Um, an example of an error would be, you know, the data was, um, you know, was when I, after it was parsed by Snowflake, there were, you know, 20 columns and then only 19 were expected, right? So we know there's some data shift, some data formatting issues going on there. Um, and so that would, that would be here. And of course, all the errors between those dates um, are available through there as well. Um, so that shows us how to go through and do that deployment piece, which is, um, which is really key, um, and monitor all the data. So let's just, let's just recap of what we saw um, through, through that demo. <clears throat> so, you know, we can see how easy it is to pull data into the managed cloud to train. And then of course that deployment piece um, and 
scoring at scale being very simple to do, regardless of the, the way that we want to um, do any of that scoring. Um, it's so critical that we provide monitoring data so that everyone knows exactly how the model is performing, um, how, you know, how, uh, how long it takes to score, if there are any particular errors that are occurring, um, and, and the cost. Um, that's really uh, quite key to the operationalization of those models. Um, you know, the last thing I'd, I'd invite everyone to, you know, try this out, try this within your environment. Um, there's a, a link to a free trial. Um, uh, it's very simple to get started. The Snowflake app is also there as well for people to try uh, when you sign up into the, um, uh, into the free trial. Uh, just type in Snowflake and you'll get all the, all the pieces that we looked at through today that you can walk through and build your own models um, and see how it works. So I'd like to thank everyone for joining us this morning. Um, hopefully this um, has been useful for people to get an understanding of the level of integration that we have with the Snowflake Data Cloud. 